Welcome back to another episode of Brands Bytes. I'm your host, Tom, bringing you the latest gadgets to the latest news and tech, all right here on this podcast. So without further ado, jumping straight in to there were so many AI robots kind of shown off this week. So starting out, if you remember Tesla a few years ago released that they were going to be making their own humanoid robot, and they were going to possibly be selling it to other people to use, using it in their own factories for things that robots just currently can't do as well as people. So how do you fix that? You build a person out of metal and AI to facilitate that for you. And so they tweeted out this video of Optimus walking around, many of them walking around in presumably a Tesla place. I mean, here's a bunch of Cybertrucks being built, worked on. And you can see that there's motor tor torque control here. And it's super impressive to the point of like it, doesn't break the egg. That guy broke the egg. So environment, I wonder how much of this is actually pretty easy for them to do where like this screen here, for instance, I'm surprised that didn't just pause that like I was hoping. Um, this screen here reminds me of seeing autopilot, Tesla's autopilot software. And I can't, I don't see why it can't be repurposed to be used like this as well. As you can see here, it's mapping all of the stuff around it and being able to discover things and then it maps it and creates like an actual map of it. Now you can see this is how they're, you know, training it with human demos and the software, what it's recording. And then you have the robot doing it itself. Now the crazy thing for me is that Tesla's AI is maybe not as clearly as it used to be, but is clearly ahead of the competition when it comes to self-driving. In terms of Porting that software over to this, it's got to be fairly easy. Also, you can see they at least have three Cybertrucks built. I don't know if they moved the same three or if they have many more than three, but they have Cybertrucks built here. But this is super cool to see. It's also terrifying to see when you think you're teaching it how to think or not think, but you're teaching it how to manipulate it with its environment, how to learn and map areas and be able to do tasks and how to be gentle and stuff like that. If you were to take like a chat GPT and just throw it in there, what are the real potentials of this? I mean, this robot could be crazy. It's pretty crazy that they're this far along already and it's only been five years. Now that said, they're not as smooth as like Boston Dynamics robots or whatever you want to call those things between the dog and the ostriches and all of that stuff. But that stuff at the same time, for the most part, seems to be kind of a pre-recorded or we've practiced this kind of thing so I don't know how special that stuff really is but this is insane that this is capable of this already and it's super hard to believe that I mean 10 years ago this seemed so far away and now it's just it's here and they're doing it and along that we have a new AI robot that's also also capable of doing sketchy stuff so Sanctuary AI's new humanoid robot stands 5'7 and can lift up to 55 pounds. The other cool part of having robots that learn like this is we're so close to making something similar to an Iron Man where you can have a robot or maybe if you're paralyzed from the waist down that can easily interact and do things the person would be capable of. Now, this is called Phoenix, its own stab at the this humanoid form factor. And it stands five foot seven, weighs 155 pounds, pretty similar to a person, and is capable of lifting payloads of up to 55 pounds and traveling up to three miles an hour. Now, three miles an hour is like on the lower end of a human walking speed, so it's not super fast. That said, it's still really cool. I mean, this thing also looks sick. To be honest, Tesla's like looks a little farther along. Tesla also seems to always make their stuff look super futuristic. And as you can see here, it's got hands. It, they literally have like some Iron Man looking stuff on it. And then it's got the vision system up top. Now, Tesla has hidden their vision system in like a mask that looks more humanoid, but this is actually like out front. Nonetheless, um, there's so many of these like happening right now. And then again, alongside AI, like we're just, we're just getting there and having having stuff is so weird. I just, 
I can't believe that at the same time we're having um, all of this stuff go down that we're also having and we're, we're having these humanoid robots happen at the same time that we're creating these structures that are smarter than people are able to answer more questions than people or any of that. I mean, there's just so much going on right now. Like when it comes to tech, we are at a turning point, a tipping point. We are right on the edge of the cliff about to take the jump and it's going to be crazy to see where we land, especially these humanoid things are weird. I mean, factory jobs, we've already talked about things like chat GPT taking away a lot of like office style jobs, but a chat GPT paired with these kind of robots is going to just get rid of the factory stuff as well. I mean, this can only do 55 pounds, but who's to say there's one that can't do more or they couldn't do more if they wanted to, or there's, <laughs> I mean, we're just, we're, we're so close and it's almost here. And next up we have a more lighthearted one. So 13,000 plus hotels across the U S are about to get EV charging stations. So with that, a ton of people are going to get access to more charging than ever. Now LNG electric may become one of the top three owner operated EV charging stations by 2028 as it's deploying these huge number of stations at hotels. Now, their goal here is to install MD is to install level two DC fast charging stations and more than 13,000 hotels and more than 40 multifamily communities across the U S now 40 is kind of weak, but the hotel thing is kind of what we're here for. Now, LNG Electric will plan to roll out these over the next five to six years. So we still got some time on this. And by then, I mean, Tesla's still going to lead the game when it comes to chargers. Now, and beginning this month, it will install its level two chargers and then level three chargers to follow. Its plan is to create a charging network that covers 10 to 15% of the U.S. hospitality market. So 10 to 15% isn't even really that much, but paired with everything else that's out there, That'll be a big thing. What is more interesting to me is if 13,000 hotels get this, right? Is that going to make you, if you're an EV owner, are you now more inclined to stay at a hotel with a charger? Like, is that that big of a deal where, like, you want your car to be charged up in the morning if you're on a road trip or if you're just out of town for the weekend? Or is it like we're going to stop and get dinner somewhere anyways that probably has a charger or there's a charger across the street? Like, does it matter as much to you to have it? at night or are you going to still go with the cheapest hotel and just plan to stop for food at some point? How big of a pull is this to electric car drivers? Cause like gas people don't think about that at all. They're like, we'll just stop for gas at some point or we'll fill up in the morning. It's not as big of a deal as something like an electric vehicle that takes much larger to charge. That said, I'm glad they're doing this again. I'm going to hit this every time we talk about EV charging. Can we just, all agree on one charging port or connector or just standardize it somehow so that when companies come along and are like, we're installing um, a million chargers, let's at least have a standardized way of doing it. But yeah, let me know down below if you think that this is something that would make you stay at a hotel over anything else. So these charges will be deployed at Marriott and Hilton Hotels in Ohio, Florida, and Illinois for the first one, Illinois. I don't know why I said noise, but we're out here. Next, we have iPhones will be able to speak in your voice with only 15 minutes of training. This is a little more crazy. So this is one of Apple's new accessibility features that we're probably going to hear more about at WWDC. But they previewed some of their stuff, and this is one of the things they did. So you would go in your iPhone accessibility features and you would start training it. And with that, it would learn your voice and then be able to speak to you in that voice after about 15 minutes of training. Now, this is, there's not much to actually see here. They didn't show too much, but how, like in terms of an accessibility feature, what is the, what is the helpfulness of this? I'm not sure. Also, there's just... It's pretty crazy that it can do it in 15 minutes, in all honesty. Now, the feature integrates with live speech. Users can then type what they have to say and then have their personal voice read it to those who ever want to talk. It uses on-device machine learning and will keep information 
locally, basically, which Apple always seems to do pretty good with keeping things local when it comes to stuff like this. I'm curious if this is going to come to a lot of people like to send voice messages. Is this something that a regular user might want to send a voice message in their voice, but they don't can't speak where they're at. So they type it and then it speaks it. Or can you just set that as like your contact so people could have like your messages always read as if it was you speaking? Like that would be kind of weird or cool or both. I mean, it's an accessibility feature. So for people that have accessibility needs, that's what this is for. But it just seems kind of like a why. Like Siri needs more help. Maybe. Maybe Siri should have been your focus. But it's Apple. They're doing things. It's kind of cool. Apple doesn't do much like super cool tech stuff. So it's interesting when they release something like this. And we'll see how well it works when that time comes. Next here we have... Samsung has released the Galaxy Fold 5 and Flip 5 release date. And this is pretty big because the Pixel Fold just came out, which means maybe Google and Samsung have been working closely together on how Android's going to look more on folding phones and make that stuff better. So last year was August 10th was the release date for these phones. They've been doing it usually around that time, and then you could purchase it and, you know, ships a few weeks later. The site now claims that they will be available for purchase on August 11th, around three weeks after the announcement. So the announcement will be July 26th will be the debut. I'm not sure why Samsung has moved this up. I don't know what the real benefit is. But nonetheless, they're releasing the Galaxy Folds. The big things I would love to see with the new Galaxy Folds is when it folds, I want it to fold all the way closed. I almost would ask for a lip around the front display because I have scratched the crap out of mine and I would appreciate it more covered. Also, let's just just bring the price down a little bit. Let's get it like 1500 for like the 512 gig model would be insane when you consider that an like iPhone 14 Pro Max can hit that exact same price tag, but instead you could just go get a folding phone so you have like an iPad plus a phone in your pocket pretty wild if they could drop that just a couple hundred bucks this year and I just I just want to see some bigger changes with the device overall because I feel like it hasn't changed in two years that said I did buy the four so I, I bought the version that changed the least but I was I was just kind of waiting I would love to see that happen I would also love to see the under display camera be like usable I would say right now it's more of like a if somehow you cracked all of your other cameras you would still go grab your laptop instead of using your phone. I mean, it's cool. It's there, but it, I don't know. It's not that big of a deal. Thinner would always be great. More battery life. All the basic stuff you would expect to see with a phone improvement would also be cool to see. But we'll have to wait and see on July 26th when they actually announce these phones what we're going to get for our new Samsung Foldable. Next up here, we have the Seattle Seahawks, which are football, if for those that don't know. And they're using AI to generate their schedule art as NFL teams try to one-up each other on social media. As you can see, these are actually, some of these are pretty funny, they're cool, and the art seems pretty unique and interesting. Now, I'm curious, um, what, who else is going to be using this? This site's just spam, but... As you can see here, our schedule through an AI-generated threads, photo of a hawk riding a ram with horns. So if you're wondering, they're playing the, <laughs> the rams. Holy crap, English is very hard. Painting of a sad line and heroic green hawk. I mean, these are fantastic in terms of what they are, but <laughs> what, are, what are the odds that more teams start doing this? Because some of these are pretty, like, Eh, kind of boring. Uh, thought bird is way bigger than the town has destroyed the town. We also have a uh, bird and a bird birding over S Seattle, which is birds. And then an English bulldog with hawks flying above. There's just so many unique things that it did here. And they're so random all over the place. And it's just another team that's starting to use a another place, thing, person that's starting to use AI. And I don't know. It's a cool way to one-up your opponents. They're also pretty fascinating to look at. But 
I mean, some of these don't even seem like they make that much sense. I mean, there's just a, when they're playing the Cowboys, there's just a stern with a cowboy hat. <laughs> like, what is, what is this? I mean, they're pretty cool to look at here. A scared gold miner for the San Francisco 49ers. And a, he's got a bird on his shoulder. You know, menacing blue hawk and a sad green eagle. Just super unique. I don't know if a person could have even come up with similar things. It's also pretty interesting how much some of these, like, like the bird looks like it's a painting here, but the background and, f like, the blanket don't. Um, some interesting inclusions in terms of what kind of art it decided to use for different things. Next up, we have the EU has cleared Microsoft's deal to buy Activision Blizzard. That said, they have a major setback in the UK where the UK basically said, uh-uh, we're not doing this yet. Um, but in the EU, they're going to, which is pretty amazing to see that another, I mean, Activision Blizzard is legitimately one of the biggest companies when it comes to video games and one of the biggest companies in the world just completely acquired it now the commission cleared the deal under the condition that the current and future activision blizzard games have to be made cross com available for cross complete competing cloud gaming services for 10 years so for the next 10 years you still have to be able to use Activision Blizzard games on Steam, on PlayStation, on any of those. They have to be made available to those platforms as well still. Now, that's for only cloud gaming services. So only the cloud gaming services of those platforms. To be completely honest, I don't think Microsoft was ever like planning on removing it from all these platforms right now anyways. I think they were going to do some Xbox exclusive stuff. I think for sure they were going to use it to help them. But the way that all these countries seem to be like, it's a cloud compute gaming thing. Um, no, I just don't think that's the main purpose here. That said, it definitely is somewhere that Microsoft is trying to go. If you've seen just how the Xbox have gotten cheaper, cheaper, cheaper. And it seems to be more and more like they're just trying to make them trying to make them so that they are a cloud gaming device but i don't i just don't think that that's the big deal they should be doing here now they are gonna go through within the eu we'll see what happens here in the u.s and everywhere else but just fascinating that they would approve it and again to have such big companies buying each other and taking such a huge player out of the market and just making microsoft like a lead game development company all of a sudden is pretty incredible to see. Next up here, we have abandoned for 13 years three brand new first generation Tesla Roadsters that were found sitting in a shipping container in China may fetch well over a million dollars. I'm pretty sure they will. That said, they don't have any way of like testing them right now so they don't know how is the battery ha held up after not being charged for 10 years how has all of that done so that said they are now up for sale and we'll see what they end up selling for but the trio has arrived in the country in 2010 and were subsequently abandoned by the owner now the electric cars have stayed inside a shipping container in a chinese dock for their entire life preserving them aesthetically in brand new condition but the cars have accrued storage chargers into the six figures, which the seller is ready to pay, which is <laughs> pretty amazing. <laughs> it's only been six figures for sitting there for that long. 13 years for three cars is doesn't sound that bad. And you can just see how outdated all of the stuff here is with these old dials and everything. I mean, it makes their current cars look like they're forever ago and... I mean, how wide, I mean, how, how, how interesting is it that there's thir three of these just sitting in shipping containers completely left behind? I believe there was an orange one, a red one, and I think there was two red ones, if I remember correctly here. Um, let's see what we can discover. Was it two orange ones? I can't remember. Now, the original Roadsters were made between 2008 and 2011, only about 2,000 of them 
were made, which makes them extremely rare, especially considering they're not made anymore. The new Roadster is on its way, but not here yet. Um, including using... I mean, this is just astounding that these are found. I mean, these interiors just look nothing like current Tesla. Sorry, I'm just all over the place for this topic. Uh, but, yeah, leaving one of these vehicles not with energy, like, not charged, not being used forever for an EV is way worse than a gas vehicle. It's way worse for the vehicle itself compared to another, like, electric car. It's a way worse to have one of these sit and do nothing compared to a gas vehicle. I'm repeating myself. Let's go. Uh, yeah, this be interesting to see what these actually end up sell for. Now, if just a refresher here on what these came with. These were based on the Lotus Elise. It came with a 53 kilowatt hour battery pack, which gave it a range of up to 244 miles, which actually, if you think about it, is pretty impressive for only a 53 kilowatt hour battery pack to get that far. Now, the electric sports car had about 300 horsepower on tap, giving it a 0-60 to 60 time of 3.7 seconds. And, I mean, that's about it. But when you think about 244 miles from 53 kilowatt hour battery pack, I mean, this car was way smaller. But if you were to double that battery pack and presumably get, like, 600 miles of range, think how insane it would be. I mean, that's what basically what they're doing with the current Roadster today is they're going to have a double the size battery pack and get double the range. Main difference being that new Roadster is going to be astronomically more powerful than this even was, and it's still going to get that range, which is quite awesome to see. Second to lastly here, we have Sam Altman was just testifying before the Senate. Now, this is one of the only times you will ever see somebody leading a giant tech company go ask Congress for regulation. If you don't know who Sam Altman is, he runs OpenAI, who runs ChatGPT, who Microsoft has invested heavily in, and is testifying before the Senate asking to be regulated more when it comes to AI, asking the government to actually get up and get ahead of technology for once instead of being stuck behind. And it's, I mean, it's just... So weird to see. I mean, Congress failed to do anything about social media, but ISPs, but all these other things. And he's just asking that, hey, we need to take a look at this. We need to be regulated. You guys need to make sure there's steps in place for AI to not go wrong, to not be used incorrectly, and to do what's possible to preserve jobs instead of these companies just paying for AI. We've seen already... On the other side of OpenAI, they have sold things to Microsoft, they have sold things to Coca-Cola, they've sold things to plenty of other com companies, and there's no reason another AI company with same or better technology couldn't come along and legitimately wipe out the jobs instead. And he's asking to be regulated, which is pretty astounding to see. Again, a, somebody is proactively asking to be regulated, not just letting it sit and go. And lastly here, sewer gators are real. This is kind of the moral of the story here. Robotic camera has encountered a five-foot alligator inside a storm drain. A literal sewer gator. As you can see, the little robotic camera is driving here towards the gator. And just imagine, this is only 50 feet away from wherever the camera started, it appears. And you can see our little friend, the gator here, who is afraid of our camera, oddly enough. But he's a little big guy there, sitting right in your sewer, ready to eat you when you walk by. Now, imagine your little dog gets washed into the sewer during a big rainstorm, and the gator would try to eat that. It's pretty interesting here. He bumps into it, and it won't even bite the camera. Um, and then it will turn around and run away. They look so weird that they can stand so tall when they, like, walk, in my opinion. I guess gators do. But, yeah... Now, this is incredible footage shared by the city of who knows because it's Florida. And that's all you need to know is Florida man finds a sewer gator with his robotic cam in a pipe. Um, the storm crew was operating it uh, to basically... They thought it was a toad, apparently. Florida people are out there and different. Um yeah, I mean, this is crazy to see. I don't know how that even gets down there. 
Now, the robot will get stuck about 340 feet down, and the gator will get away. But, like, why? And how do they, do they get that out of there? Do they leave that there? What is it eating down there? Like, are they just eating, like, toads and, I guess, people's dogs when they get washed down there in rainstorms? I'm not sure what's happening here. But it's in Florida, and that's just kind of the way Florida goes. This is probably a normal thing to these people. I doubt that they have never seen this before. They probably have. This just might be the first time they have video of it. Um, the goal of these robots is to detect and measure water flow rates as well as quality and temperature and blah, 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 blah. Make sure things are going well and not alarmingly. The, but apparently the most alarming thing in your sewer is literally an alligator, which makes me even more terrified to go to Florida because what if a snake is down there and climbs up my toilet? I don't want that, and... Especially if there's a gator, that is even more terrifying. Imagine you wake up in the middle of the night, your toilet's dislodged from the floor, and there's just a gator sitting in your bathroom. Um, no thanks. I will never live in Florida for that reason. Plus, that is terrifying. I can see how they might have thought that was a toad at first, but like... Um... Nope. Chomp. Uh, and with that, thanks for watching this episode of Brands Bites. I hope you enjoyed this one. I was all over the place today, but if you did enjoy it, let me know down below. If you have any ideas, any suggestions, any topics you want to see covered, also let me know down below. And with that, I'll catch you guys in the next one. See ya.